I'm Sunny, story time. I see that nobody's around, so I won't stop to chat with anybody, but I'll go ahead and get started. First book I'm reading is The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth. I chose this to be my first book reading because a individual chapter is its own story and they're all connected, kind of like in the realm of Winnie the Pooh. The first chapter is The Riverbank. Noel had been working very hard all the morning, spring cleaning his little home, with brooms, then with dusters, then on ladders and steps and chairs, with a brush and a pitch, till he had dust in his throat and eyes and splashes of whitewash all in an aching back and weary arms. Spring was moving the air above and went around him, penetrating even his dark and low little house with its spirit of intent and longing. It's a small wonder, then, that he suddenly poked down his brush on the floor, said, Bother! and oh, blow! Bring cleaning! and bolted out of the house without even waiting to put on his coat. Spring up above was calling him imperiously, and he made for the steep little insert in his case to the graveling carriage drive owned by animals whose red residences were near to the sun and air. Scratched and scrabbled and scrooged, and then he scrooged it again and scrabbled and scraped, working busily with his little paws and muttering to himself. Up we go, till at last, pop, his snout came out into the sunlight, and he found himself rolling in of a great meadow. This is fine, better than whitewashing. The sunshine struck hot on his fur, caressing his heated brow, and after the and after the seclusion which he had been living in so long, the happy uh, carol of happy birds, old hearing, almost like a shout, jumping off all at once, in the joy of living and the delight of spring without its cleaning, he the meadow till he reached the hedge of the further side. Old oh, elderly rabbit at the gap, sixpence for the travel, the privilege of a private road. He was bowled over in an instant by a contemptuous pole, a mole, who trotted along the side of the head and the other rabbits as they peeped hurriedly from there the row was about. Onion sauce, onion sauce, he remarked to Jeeves on before they could think of a thoroughly satisfactory reply. Then they all started, how stupid are you? Why didn't you tell him? Well, why didn't you say? He reminded him, and so on, in the usual way. But of course it was then, much as it always, as is always the case. It all seemed too good to be true through the meadows. He rambled busily along the hedgerows, across the cock, finding everywhere birds building, flowers budding, leaves the rustling, happy and progressive and occupied. And instead of having an uneasy trickling him and whispering, whitewash, he somehow could not feel it was to be the only idle dog among all of these busy citizens. For all, the best part of the holiday is perhaps not so much to be resting or see all the other fellows busy working. He thought his happiness was complete, and aimlessly along. Suddenly he stood by the edge of a full... Never in his life had he seen a river before. This sinuous, full-bodied animal, chilling, gripping things with a gurgle and leaving them with a laugh to find fresh playmates that shook themselves free and were caught and held. All was a shake and a shiver, glints and gleams and sparkles, rustle, chatter and bubble. The mole was bewitched and tranced. By the side of the river he trotted as one trots, when very smooth of a man who holds one spellbound by excited stories, and when he sat on the bank while the river still chattered on to him, babbling for stories in the world sent from the heart of the earth to be told to the insatiable sea. As he sat on the grass and looked at the dark hole in the bank opposite, just above the water's edge, caught his eye, and he fell to considering what a nice snug dwelling place it would make for an animal and fond of a bijou riverside residence, above remote from dust and noise. As he gazed, something bright and small down in the heart of it vanished and twinkled once more like a tiny star. Hardly be a star in such an unlikely situation, and it was too glittering and small. Then, as he looked, it winked at him, and so declared itself, and a small face began gradually to grow around it, like a frame round a 
little brown face with whiskers, a grave round face in its eye that had first attracted his notice, small neat ears, slick uh, silky hair. It was the water rat. Stood and regarded each other cautiously. Hello, mole, said the rat. Hello, rat, said the mole. Would you like to come over? inquired the rat presently. Well, it's all very nice to uh, talk, said the mole, rat, he being new to a river and riverside life in its ways. The rat said nothing but stopped and unfastened a rope and hauled on it, lightly stepping into a little boat with the mole that the mole had not observed. It blew outside and white within, and was just the size for the two animals, and leaned out to it at once, even though he did not yet fully understand it. The rat sculled smartly across and made it fast. Then he caused the mole stepped gingerly down. Lean on that, he said. Lively. And the mole, to his surprise and rapture, found himself actually seated real boat. This has been a wonderful day, said he, shoved off and took to the skulls again. Do you know I've never been in a boat before all? What? cried Rat, open-mouthed. Never been in a... You... I... What have you been doing, then? Is it so that? asked Mole shyly, though he was quite prepared to believe it as he was seat and surveyed the cushions, the oars, the rowlocks, and all the fascinating, and felt the boat sway lightly under him. Nice. Only thing, said the water rat solemnly, and he leaned forward for his stroke. My young friend, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, half so much really messing about in boats. Simply messing, he went on dreamily. About in boats, messing. Look ahead, rat, cried the mole suddenly. The boat struck the bank full tilt. The dreamer, the joyous oarsman, lay on the boat, his heels in the air. About in boats, or with non composedly, picking himself with a pleasant laugh. In a row, it doesn't matter. Nothing seems really to matter. That's the charm of it. Whether you get a wrong, whether you arrive at your destination, or whether you reach somewhere else, or where at all. You've all you're always busy, and you never do anything in particular. Fun. It, uh, and when you've done it, there's always something to do it if you like, but you'd better not. You'd much better not. Look, really nothing else on hand this morning, supposing we drop down the river together and have it. The mole waggled his toes with sheer happiness, with a sigh of full contentment, and leaned back blissfully into the soft cushion. What a day I'm having, he said. Let us start at once. Old heart at he looped the painter through a ring in his ladling at landing, climbed up into this hole above, and after a short interval, reappeared staggering wicker luncheon basket. Shove that under your feet, he observed to the mole, down into the boat. Then he untied the painter and took the skulls again, asked the mole, wriggling with curiosity. There's cold chicken inside it, replied the rat for a cold tongue. Cold ham, cold beef pickle, cold pickle. Gherkin, saffron, and wedge, spotted meat, ginger beer, lemonade, soda. Oh, stop, stop, cried the mole in ecstasy. Is this too much? Do you really? inquired the rat seriously. It's only that I always take on these little ex And the other animals are always telling me that I'm a mean beast and cut it very fine. The mole never heard a word he was saying, absorbed in the new life he was entering upon, dedicated with the sparkle, the ripple, the scents. And the sound and the sun the paw in the water and dreamed long waking dreams. The rod, like the good fellow he was, sculled steadily on and forbore of him. I like your clothes awfully, old chap, he remarked after some half hours. I'm going to get a black velvet smoking soup myself some day, as soon as I can afford it. your pardon, said the mole, pulling himself together with an effort. You must think me all this is new to me. So this is a river. The rat. And you really live by the river? What a jolly life! By on it and in it, said the rat. It's brother and sister to me. Nance and company. Drink and naturally washing. It's my world and I don't want any other. It hasn't got is not worth having. And what it doesn't know is not worth knowing. Or together. Look in winter or uh, whether in winter or summer, spring or autumn. It's fun in its excitements. When the floods are on in February and my cellar brimming with drink, that's good 
uh, no good to me, and the brown wad best bedroom window, or again, when it all drops away and shows it smell like plum cake, and the rushes and weed clog the channels, and potter about dry shod over most of the bed of it, and find fresh food and things careless people have dropped out of the boats. But is it all at times, the mole ventured to ask, just you and the river and pass a word with? No one else to... Well, I mustn't be hard on you, forbearance. You're new to it, and of course you don't know. The bank is so... Cr Many people are moving away altogether. Oh, no. It isn't what it used to be at all. Fishers, dab chicks, more hens, all of them about all day long, and all you to do something. As if a fellow had no business of his own to attend. What lies over there? Asked the mole, waving a paw towards the background of woodland framed the water meadows on one side of the river. That, Eldwood said the rat shortly. We don't go there very much, we river bankers. They, aren't they very nice people in there? Said the mole with a trifle nervously. Well, replied the rat, let me see. The squirrels are all right, and the rabbits, some of them. But rabbits are a mixed lodger, of course. He lives right in the heart of it. Wouldn't live anywhere else, whether if you paid him to do it. Dear old badger, nobody interferes with him. They'd bet significantly. Why, who should interfere with him? Uh, well, of course, there are others, explained the rat sort of way. Weasels and stoats and foxes, and they're all right in a way. I'm very good friends with them. Past the time of day when we... But they break out sometimes. There's no denying it. And then, well, you can't really trust the fact. The mole knew well that it was quite against and on possible trouble ahead, or even to allude to it, so he dropped the subject. On the wild wood again, he asked, where it's all blue and dim. It... Uh, what may be hills, or perhaps they mayn't, and sometimes like this, or is it only cloud drift? Beyond the wildwood comes the wide world, and there's something that doesn't matter, either to you or me. I'm never going, no, nor you either, if you've got any sense at all. Do it again, please. Now then, here's our backwater at last, where we're going. Leaving the main stream, they now passed into what seemed at first a little landlocked lake. Green turf sloped down to either and snaky tree roots gleamed below the surface of the quiet water, while a head shoulder and foamy tumble of a warm uh, of a wear, arm in arm, dripping mill wheel that held up in its turn a gray gabled, sorry, gray gabled mill house filled the air with soothing murmur and smothery, yet with little clear voices speaking up cheerfully both. It was so very beautiful that the mole could only hold up two four pots. Oh my, oh my, oh my! The rat brought the boat alongside the bank. Her fast helped, made her fast, helped the still awkward mole say, swung out the luncheon basket. The mole begged as a favor to be allowed to unpack, and the rat was very pleased to indulge him and to sprawl at full length on the grass while his, his excited friend shook out the tablecloth and spread it took out packets one by one and arranged their contents in due order, still gasping, oh my, at each fresh revelation. When all was ready, the rat said, an old fellow, and the mole was indeed very glad to obey, for he had started at a very early hour that morning, as people will do, and he had paused for a bite or sup, and had been through a very great deal of time, which now seemed so many days ago. What are you looking at presently? When the edge of their hunger was nowhere dulled, and the mole's eyes were able to wander off the tablecloth a little bit. I'm looking at a streak of bubbles that I see traveling along, along the surface. That is something that strikes me as funny. Bubbles? Oh, said the rat, eerily as an inviting, an inviting sort of way. A broad glistening muzzle above the water of the bank, and the otter hauled himself out and shook the water from his coat. Beggars, he observed, making for the provender. Why didn't you invite me? This is an impromptu affair, replied the rat. By the way, my friend, Mr. Proud, I'm sure, said the otter, and the two animals were friends forthwith. Everywhere, continued the otter. All the world seems out on the river. Came up this backwater to try and get a moment's peace and then stumble upon you fellows. Uh, pardon, I don't exactly mean that, you know. 
there was a rustle behind an old badger, shouted the rat. The badger trotted forward a pace or two, then grabbed company and turned his back and disappeared from view. That's just the sort of observed the disappointed rat. Simply hates society. Now he knew everything. The two animals looked at each other and laughed. Nothing but sailing, said the rat. Then he tired of that and took out. Nothing would please him but a punt all day and every day and a nice mess he made of it. For the houseboating and, well, we had all had to go in his houseboat and pretend we liked it. He was going to spend the rest of his life. It's the... It's all the same. Whatever he takes up, he gets tired of and fresh. Such a good fellow, too, remarked the otter reflectively, but no especially in a boat. From where they sat, they could get a glimpse of the main of the island that separated them, and just then a wager boat flashed into the short, stout figure, splashing badly and rolling a good deal, but working him. The rat stood up and hailed him, but Toad, for it was he, stood his head, settled sternly to his work. He'll be out of the boat in a minute if he rolls like that and down again. Of course he will, chuckled the otter. Did I that good story about Toad and the lock keeper? It happened this way. Toad, I swerved unsteadily, athwart the current in the intoxicated fashion bloods of mayflies seen life. A swirl of water in the mayfly was visible no more. Neither was the otter. The voice was still in his ears, but the turf... Some uh, whereupon called was clearly vacant, not an otter to be seen as far as the distant horizon. But again there was a streak of bubbles on the surface of the river. The rat humble re recollected that animal etiquette forbade any sort of comment on the sight of one's friends at any moment, for any reason or no reason whatsoever. Well, well, said the rat, I suppose we ought to be moving. I wonder which of us had luncheon basket. He did not speak as if he was frightfully eager for the treat. Me, said the mole, so of course the rat let him. Packing the basket is such pleasant work as unpacking the basket. It never is. But the mole was doing everything, and although just when he had got the basket packed and straight, he saw a plate staring up at him from the grass. And when the job had been done, the rat pointed out a fork, which nobody ought to have seen, and last of all, a pot, which had been sitting on without knowing it, which he had been sitting on with. Still, somehow, the thing got finished at last, without much loss of temper. The afternoon sun was getting low on as the rat sculled gently, honey mood, murmuring poetry things over to himself, and not paying much attention. But the mole was very full of lunch, and self-satisfaction and pride white at home in a boat, so he thought, and was getting a bit restless. He said, Ratty, please, I want to row now. The rat with a smile, not yet, my young friend, he said. Wait till you've got a few lessons, as easy it is, as it looks. The mole was quiet for a moment or two, but more and more jealous of Rat, sculling so strongly and so easily, a ride began to whisper that he could do it every bit as well. He did the skulls so suddenly that the rat, was gazing out over this water poetry things to himself had taken was taken by surprise off his seat with his legs in the air for the second time which the mole took his place and grabbed the skulls with entire confidence stop us cried the rat from the bottom of the boat you can't do it you'll have us all. the mole flung his skulls back with a flourish and made a great dig at the water altogether his legs flew up above his head and he found himself lying in the tight rat great alarm greatly alarmed he made a grab at the next moment sploosh over went the boat and he found himself struggling in the river how cold the water was and oh how very wet it felt how it went down 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 how bright and welcome the sun looked as he was coughing and spluttering how black was his despair when he felt himself sinking then a firm paw grabbed him by the back of his neck. It was the rat, and he laughing, and Mole could feel him laughing right down his arm and through his paw to his, the Mole's, neck. The rat got hold of the skull and shook his arm. Then he did the same by the other side of him, and swimming propelled the helpless animal to shore, hauled him out, and set him down on the bank, pulpy lump of misery. 
When the rat had rubbed him down a bit, the wet of him, out of him, he said, Now then, old fellow, trot up and down path as hard as you can till you're warm and dry again, while I dive for the lunch. So the dismal mole, wet without and ashamed within, trotted about dry, while the rat plunged into the water again, recovering the boat, rather fast, fetched his floating property to shore by degree, he dived successfully for the luncheon basket and struggled to land with it. For a start once more, the mole limped and dejected, limp and dejected in the stern of the boat, and as they set off, he said in a low voice, broken with a ratty, my generous friend, I am very sorry indeed for my full conduct. My heart quite fails me when I think how I might have lost in basket. Indeed, I have been a complete ass, and I know it. Will you overlook it this and let things go on as before? That's all right, bless you, rat cheerfully. It's a little wet to, what's a little wet to a water rat? Water than out of the, these days. Don't you think any more about it. And look here, I'd better come and stop with me for all, for a little time. It's very plain and rough. You know, not like Toad's house at all, but you haven't seen that make you comfortable, and I'll teach you to row and to swim, and you'll soon be as handy on the The mole was so touched by his kind manner of speaking that he could to answer him, and he had to brush away a tear or two with the back of his paw. But the looked in another direction, and presently the mole spirits, and he was even able to give some straight back talk to a couple of more hands sniggering to each other about his bedraggled appearance. When they made a bright fire in the parlor and planted the mole in an armchair in front of it on a dressing gown and slippers for him and told him river stories till very thrilling stories they wore too to an earth-dwelling animal like mole. Stories about wares and sudden floods and leaping pike and hard bottles. At least bottles were certainly flung and from stream early by them, and about herons and how particular they were uh, they spoke to, and about adventures down drains and night fishings with excursions far afield with badger. Supper was a most cheerful meal, but were, and a terribly sleepy mole had to be escorted upstairs by host to the best bedroom, where he soon laid his head on his pillow in great peace, knowing that his newfound friend, the river was lapping the sill of his. This day was only the first of many similar ones, for the emancipation of them longer and fuller of interest as the ripening summer moved onward. He learned to swim and to row, and entered to the joy of running water, and with ray and reed stems he caught at intervals something of what the wind bring so constantly among them. Number two, the open road. Ratty, said the mole suddenly, for afternoon, if you please, I want to ask you a favor. The rat was sitting on the river bank, singing a little song. He had just composed it himself, so he was very taken up with it. Say, not proper, not pay proper attention to mole or anything else. In the morning, he had been swimming in the river in company with his friends, the ducks. The ducks stood in their ha heads suddenly, as ducks will. He would dive down just under where their chins would be if ducks had chins. Still, they were till they were forced to come up to the service again in a hurry, spluttering and angry and shaking them. For it is impossible to stay quiet. All you feel when you're, or at least they implored him to go away and attend to their, his own affairs, mind theirs. So the rat went away, and sat on the river bank in the sun, a song about them, which he called Duck City. The backwater through the rushes tall. Ducks are a dabbling up. Tails, ducks, tails, drakes, tails, yellow feet a quiver, yellow bills all busy in the river, slushy green undergrowth where the roach swim, keep our larder cool and full and dim, every one for what he like be, heads down, tails up, dabbling free, high in the whirl, swift swirl and call, we are all, tails all. I don't know. What I think, that little song rat observed the mole cautiously. He was no poet himself, he who knew it, and he had a candid nature. Neither replied the rat cheerfully. They say 
Why can't fellows what they like when they like and as they like instead of other fellows sitting on bang them all the time and making remarks and poetry and things about them? Since it all is, that's what the ducks say. So it is, so it is, said with great heartiness. No, it isn't, cried the rat indignantly. Well, then it is, replied the mole soothingly. But what I wanted to ask you was, won't you take Mr. Toad? I've heard so much about him, and I do so want to make his... Why, certainly, said the good-natured rat, jumping to his feet and dismissing poetry from Get to the boat out, and we'll paddle up there at once. It's time to call on Toad. Early or late, he is always the same fellow. Always good tempy, you always sorry when you go. He must be a very nice animal, observed the mole into the boat and took the skulls while the rat settled himself comfortably in the stern. The best of animals, replied the rat. So simple, so good-natured, and so affectionate. Perhaps he's not very clever. We can't all be geniuses, and it may be that he's full and conceited. But he has got some great qualities, has Toady. And in the river, they came in sight of a handsome, dignified old house of mellowed red, well-kept lawns reaching down to the water's edge. There's Toad Hall, so the creek on the left, where the notice board says private, no landing allowed. That's where we'll leave the boat. The stables are over there to the right. That's the bank well you're looking at now. Very old, that is. Toad is rather rich, even and really one of the nicest house in, houses in all these parts, though we never a toad. They glided up the creek, and the mole shipped his nest into the shadow of a large boathouse. Here they saw many handsome boats, lost beams, or hauled up on a slip, not but, one, but none in the woods had an unused and a deserted air. The rat looked around him, said he. Boating is played out. He's tired of it and done with it. New fad he has taken up now. Come along, let's look him up. We shall hear quite soon enough. They disembarked and strolled across the gay flowered deck in search of Toad, whom they presently happened upon resting in a wicker garden, a preoccupied expression on his face, and a large map spread out on his knees. Hey, he said, jumping up, seeing them. This is splendid! He shook the paws of both, never waiting for an introduction to the mole. How kind of you, he went on, dancing. Just going to send a boat down the river for you, Ratty, with strict orders that you were to be fetched, whatever you were doing. I want you badly, both of you. Now, what will you take of something? You don't know how lucky it is you're turning up with us now. Let's sit, Toady, said the rat, throwing himself into an easy chair, while Mole took another to and made some civil remarks about Toad's delightful residence. Finest house on the whole river, cried Toad boisterously, or for that matter, and he could not help adding. Here, the mole, unfortunately, the toad saw him do it, turned very red. The painful silence. Then Toad burst out laughing. All right, Ratty, he said, you know, and it's not such a very bad house, is it? You know you rather like it. Now look here, let's be sensible. You are the very animals I wanted. It's most important. It's about your rowing, I suppose, said the innocent heir. You're getting on fairly well, though you splash a good bit still. Great deal of patience, and any quality of coaching you may... Oh, pooh, bowed in great disgust. Silly boyish amusement. I've given long ago. Sheer waste of time, that's what, I, what it is. It makes me to see you fellows who ought to know better, spending all your energies in that. No, I've discovered the real thing, the only genuine occupation for a lifetime. I propose to devote the, the remainder of mine to it, and can wasted years that lie behind me squandered in trivialities. Dear Ratty and your amiable friend also, if he will be so good, just as far as the stable yard, and you shall see what you shall see the way to the stable yard accordingly, the rat following with, with the most distrust mission, and there, drawn out of the coach house onto the open gypsy caravan, shining with newness, painted canary yellow, picked up, and red wheels. There you are, said the road, nothing and expanding himself. There's real life for you, embodied in that little road, the dusty highway, the heath, the common, the hedgerows, the rolling down Camps, villages, towns, cities, here today, up and up to somewhere, travel, change, interest, excitement, the whole world before you in a horizon changing. 
And mind, this is the finest card of its sort that has ever any exception. Come inside and look at the arrangements. Planned them all myself. The mole was tremendously interested in excitement, excited, and followed him eagerly and into the interior of the caravan. The rat only snorted and thrust into his pockets, remaining where he was. It was indeed very common, like sleeping bunks, a little table that folded up against the wall, a cookie lockers, bookshelves, a bird cage with a bird in it, and pots and kettles of every size and variety. All complete, said the toad, pulling up a locker. You see, biscuits, potted lobster, salt, everything you can possibly want, soda water here, bakey there, press, bacon, jam, cards and dominoes you'll find you as he descended the steps again you'll find that nothing that ever has been forgotten make our start this afternoon i beg your pardon says he chewed a straw but did i overhear you say something about we at end this afternoon now you dear good old rat toad imploringly don't begin talking in that stiff and sniffy sort of way we got to come i can't simply possibly manage without you so please can don't argue it's the one thing i can't stand you surely don't mean to fuss the old river all your life and just live in a hole in a bank and i want to show you the world i'm gonna make an animal out of you my boy care said the rat doggedly i'm not coming and that's flat and i'll stick to my old river and live in a hole and boat as i've always done more mole uh, and what's more mole's going to stick to me and do as i do of course i am said the mole loyally i'll always stick to you rat a is has is to be has got to be all the same might have been well, rather fun you know he added with small, the life adventurous was so new to him, and so thrilling, and this fresh so tempting, and he had fallen in love at first sight with the canary-colored cart fitments. The rat saw what was passing in his mind and wavered, disappointed people, disappointing people, and he was fond of the mole, and would do almost anything. Toad was watching both of them closely. Come along in and have some diplomatically, and we'll talk it over. We need decide anything in a hurry. I don't really care. I only want to give pleasure to my fellows. Live for auto in life. During luncheon, which was excellent, of course, as everything at least was, the toad simply let himself go, disregarding the play upon the inexperienced mole as on a harp, naturally of mole, and always mastered by his Im imagination, he picks of the trip and the joys of the ocean life and the roadside in such glowing colors that the mole could hardly sit in his chair for excitement. Some taken for granted by all three of them, but the trip was a settled thing, and still unconvinced in his mind allowed his good nature to override his personal object. He could not bear to disappoint his two friends, who were already deep in sin, planning out each day's separate occupation. For several when they were quite ready, the now triumphant Toad led his companions, companions to the paddock and set them to capture the old gray horse, without having been consulted, and to his own extreme annoyance had been told Toad for the do a dustiest job in his dusty expedition, frankly preferred the paddocks, and took a deal of catching. Meantime, the lockers still tighter with necessaries, and hung nets of onions, bundles of hay, and baskets from the bottom of the cart. As the horse was caught and harnessed, and they set off, all talking at once, each trudged by the side of the cart or sitting on the shaft, as the humor took hold an afternoon. The smell of the dust was kicked up with rich and the smell of the dust they kicked up was rich and satisfying. Out of either side of the road, Birds called and whistled to them cheerily. Good neighbors passed them, gave them good day, or stopped to say nice things about their beauty. And rabbits sitting at their front doors in the hedgerows, held up by four. Oh my! Oh my! Oh my! Late in the evening, tired and happy, and they drew up on a remote common, far from habitations, horse loose to graze, and ate their simple supper, sitting uh, sitting aside of the cart. Toad talked about uh, talked big about all the days to come, while stars grew fuller and larger all around them, and appearing suddenly 
and silently, from nowhere in particular, came to keep them listen to their talk. At last they turned to them into the great the little bunk. Toad, kicking out his legs, sleepily said, Well, good night, you fellows. Real life for a gentleman. Talk about your old river. About my river, replied the patient rat. You know I don't, Toad. But I, he added pathetically, in a lower tone, I think about it. The mole reached out from under his blanket, felt for the rat's paw in the squeeze. I'll do whatever you like, Ratty, he whispered. Shall we run, we run home quite early, very early, and go back to our dear old hole in the river? No, we'll see it out, whispered back Rat. Thanks awfully, but I ought to stick by Toad. To him. It wouldn't be safe for him to be left to himself. It won't take very long. Good night. The end was indeed nearer than even the rat suspected. With so much open air and excitement, the toad slept very soundly, and no one mouths him out of the bed the next morning. So the mole and the rat turned in manfully, and while the rat saw to the horse, and lit a fire and cleaned the platters and got things ready for breakfast, and mole trudged off to the nearest village, along with eggs and various necessaries, the toad had, of course, forgotten to provide. The hard work had all been done, and the two animals were resting, thoroughly exhausted by the dirt on the scene, fresh and gay, remarking what a pleasant, easy life it was as they uh, they were all leading now, after the cares and worries and fatigues of how they had a pleasant ramble that day over grassy downs and high lanes, and camped, as before, on a common, only this time the two guests would do his fair share of work. In consequence, when the time came for starting, Toad was by no means so rapturous about the simplicity of the primitive land, indeed attempted to resume his place in his bunk, whereupon he was hauled by force. Their way lay, as before, across country by narrow till afternoon that they came out on the high road. Their first high road, distant fleet and unforeseen, sprang out on them, distant a disaster indeed to their expedition but simply overwhelming in its effect on the of Toad. They were strolling along the high road easily, the mole talking to him, since the horse had complained that he was being frightfully left out of it, considered him in the latest and in the least. The toad and the water rat walked the cart talking together, at least Toad was talking, and Rat was saying it in a And what did you say to him? And thinking all the time of something very different, far behind them they heard faint warning hum, like the drone of a distant bee. Glancing back, they saw a small cloud of dust with a dark center of energy and at incredible speed, while from out the dust of poop wailed like an uneasy animal in pain, hardly regarding it in their conversation, when in an instant, as it seemed, the peaceful scene, and with a blast of wind and a whirl of sound that made them jump for the nearest ditch, then poop, poop, ran with a brazen shout in their ears. They had a moment's glimpse of an interior, of glistening plate glass and rich Morocco, and motor car in immense, breath-snatching, passionate, and its and hugging its wheel, possessed all the earth and all for the fraction of an enveloping cloud of dust that blinded and enwrapped them utterly, and then back in the far distance, changed back into a droning bee once more. The gray horse dreamed as he plodded along his quiet paddock in a nation such as this simply abandoned himself to be natural and natural emotions. Rearing, plunging, backing steadily in spite of all at his head, and all the mold's lively language directed at his better foot of the cart backwards towards the deep ditch at the side of the road. It wavered in there in a heart-rending crash, and the canary-colored cart, their pride in their side in the ditch, an irredeemable wreck. The rat rode simply transported with passion. You villains, he shouted, shaking. Scoundrels, you highwaymen, you, you road hogs. I'll have the hurt you. I'll take you through all the courts. His homesickness had quite slipped away. For the moment, he was the skipper of the canary-colored vessel, driven in a shoal by the wrecking of rival mariners, and he was trying to recollect all the fine as he used to say to masters of steam launchers when they, their wash as they drink used to flood his parlor carpet at home. Toad sat straight the dusty road, his legs stretched out before him, and stared fixedly in the during motor car. He breathed short, his face wore a placid expression, 
and at intervals he faintly murmured, Boop. White uh, was busy trying to quiet the horse, which he succeeded in doing. Then he went to look at the cart on its side in the ditch. It was indeed a sorry sight, windows smashed, axles hopelessly bent, one wheel off, sardine to the wide world, and the bird in the birdcage sobbing pitifully and calling. The rat came to help him, but their united efforts were not like the cart. Hi, Toad, they called. Go ahead and bear a hand, can't you? The Toad never answered a word or beat in the road, so they went to see what was the matter with him. They found him in his, a happy smile on his face. His eyes fi still fixed on the dusty wake of their destroyer. At intervals, he heard to murmur, Poop, poop. The rat shook him by the shoulder. Coming to help us, Toad? He demanded sternly. Glorious stirring, murmured Toad, never offering to move. The poetry of motion travel, the only way to travel. Here today, in next week, tomorrow. Villages skipped, towns and cities jumped, always somebody else's. Oh, bliss, oh, poop, poop, oh, my, oh, my. Oh, stop being an ass, uh, cried the mole despairingly. And to think I never knew, went me monotone. All those wasted years that lad behind me, I never knew, dreamed. But now, but now that I know, now that I fully know what a flowery track lies spread before me, henceforth, what dust clouds shall spring up behind me as I speed on my reckless way, hearts I shall fling carelessly into the ditch in the wake of my magnificent onset, little carts, common carts, canary colored carts. Asked the mole with the water rat. Nothing at all, replied the rat firmly. But there is really nothing to be done. You see, I know him from of old. I'm possessed. He has got a new craze, and it always takes him that way. And it will continue like that for a day now. Like an animal walking in a happy dress for all the practical purposes. Never mind him. Let's go and see what there is to be done. A careful inspection showed them that even if they by themselves, the cart would travel no longer. The axles were in a hopeless wheel was shattered into pieces. The rat nodded the horse's reins over his took him by the head, carrying the bird cage and its hysterical occupant in the other hand. Come on, he said grimly to Mole. It's five or six miles to the nearest town and we walk. The sooner we make a start, then better. But what about Toad? Mole anxiously as they set off together. We can't leave him here, sitting in the middle of the road by him, distracted state he's in. It's not safe. Supposing another thing were to come along. Oh, bother, Toad, said the ma rat severely. I've d I've done with him. They had not proceeded very far on their way, however, when there was a pattering of feet caught them up and thrust a paw inside the elbow of each of them, still bringing into vacancy. Now look here, Toad, said Rat sharply, as soon you'll have to go straight to the police station and see if they know anything about that mong's do, and lodge a complaint against it. And then you'll have to go to the wheel rights and arrange for the cart to be fetched and mended and put to rights. Time, but it's not quite a hopeless smash. Meanwhile, the mole and I will go in comfortable rooms where we can stay till the cart's ready and till your nerves have recovered. Police station! Complaint! murmured the me complain of that beautiful, that heavenly vision that has been safe to me. Mend the cart! I've done with carts forever. I never ought to hear of it again. Oh, ratty, unbeaten that thunderbolt! I might never have heard sound or smelled that bewitching smell. I had all to owe it all to friends. The rat turned from him in despair. You see what it said to the mole, addressing him across Toad's head. He's quite hopeless. I give it to town. We'll go to the railway station, and with luck, we may pick up a train there that river bank tonight. And if I ever catch me, uh, and if you ever catch me with this provoking animal again, he snorted, and during the rest of that wearied his remarks exclusively to mole. On reaching straight to the station, and deposited to the waiting room, giving a porter twopence to keep a strict eye on him, left the horse in an inn stable, and gave what directions they could about contents. 
Eventually, a slow train having landed them at a station not very far off, they escorted the spellbound sleepwalking toad to his door, but instructed his housekeeper to feed him, undress him, and put him to bed. Their boats from the house, uh, the boathouse, stole down the river home, and our sat down to supper at their own cozy riverside parlor, to the rat's contentment. The following evening, the mole, who had risen late and taken all day, was sitting on the bank fishing, when the rat, who had been looking up his friend, came strolling along to find him. Heard the news, he said. There's nothing else all along the river bank. Toad went up to town by an early train, has ordered a large and very expensive motor car. Gonna drink some tea. And now we're on to chapter three. Wood. The mole had long wanted to make the acquaintance of. He seemed, by all accounts, to be such an important personage and visible to make his unseen influence felt by everybody about the place. But whatever the mole mentioned his wish to the river rat, he always found himself. It's all right, the rat would say. Badger will turn up some day or other. Couldn't you ask him here, dinner or something? said the mole. He wouldn't, the rat, simply. Badger hates society and invitations and dinner and all that. Well, then, supposing we go and call on him, suggested the mole. I'm sure we wouldn't like, he wouldn't like that at all, said the rat, quite alarmed. So very shy, he'd be sure to be offended. I've never been ventured to call on him at his own home myself, though I know him so well. We can't. It's quite out of the question. Besides, he lives in the very middle of the wild wood, and he does, said the mole. He told me the wild wood was all right, you know. Oh, so it is, replied the rat evasively. But I think we won't go there just now. It's a long way, and we he wouldn't be at home at this time of year, and he'll be coming along some day if you'll wait quietly. The mole had to be content or never came along, and every day brought his amusements. The mole was long over, and cold and frost in miry ways kept them much indoors, and the swollen river raced past outside their windows with a speed that mocked it sort of kind, that he found his thoughts dwelling again with much persistent very gray badger, who lived his own life by himself in his hole in the middle of the in the winter time, the rat slept a great deal, retiring early and rising in his short day. He sometimes scribbled poetry or did other small domestic and, of course, there were always animals dropping in for a chat. There was a good deal of storytelling and comparing notes on the past summer, and all such a rich chapter it had been. When one day, one came all, with illustrations so numerous and so very highly colored, the river bank had marched steadily along, unfolding itself in scene pictures of each other in stately procession. Purple loose strife arrived, purple loose strife arrived early, shaking tangled locks along the edge of the mirror, whence it once faced the laughing willow herb, tender and wistful, like a pink sunset cloud, was not slow. Comfrey, the purple hand in hand with the white, crept forth to place in the line, and at last, one morning, the difficult and delaying dog rose delicately, dog rose, stepped delicately on the stage, and one knew, had announced it in stately chords that strayed into a gavotte. June, or at last, was here. One member of the company was still awaited for the nymphs to woo. The knight for whom the ladies waited the window was to kiss the sleeping summer back to life and love. But when Meadow Sweet, Chris, and Amber Jerkin followed graciously to his place in the group, the day was ready to begin. And what a play it had been! Drowsy animal snow, wind, and rain were battering at their doors, recalled still keen morning, an hour before sunrise, when the white mist is white as yet unclosely along the surface of the water. Then the shock of the early plunge to scamper along the bank, the radiant transformation of earth, air, along uh, and water. Then suddenly the sun was it was gold and color was born and sprang out of the earth once more. The langur languorous siesta of hot midday, deep in green undergrowth, striking through in tiny golden shafts and spots. The boating and bathing afternoon, 
the ramblings along dusty lanes and through the yellow cornfields in the evenings at last, when so many threads were gathered up, so many fit and so many adventures planned for the morrow. There was plenty to talk about on their days when the animals found themselves round the fire, still of spare time on his hands, and so one afternoon, when the rat in his lays was sudden alternately dozing and trying over rhymes that wouldn't he formed the resolution to go out by himself and explore the wild wood and perhaps tents with mr badger it was a cold still afternoon with the sky overhead and he slipped out of the warm parlor into the open air he lay bare entirely entirely leafless around him and he thought he had never seen so been so that he had never seen so far and so into the inside of things as on that winter day when nature was slumber and seemed to have kicked the clothes off copses trees and all hidden places which had been mysteriously mines for ex summer now exposed themselves and their secrets that they overlooked their shabby po poverty for a while till they were they could run as before and trick and entice him with the old deceptions they and yet cheer, uh, cheery rating. He was glad that he liked the country undecorated, hardened stripe of its finery. He had got down to the bare bones of it, and they were still fine and He did not want the warm clover and the play of seeding, seeding grasses, the quick set, the billowy drapery of beech and elm seemed, and with great cheerfulness of spirit, he pushed on, on toward which lay before him now and threatening, like a black reef in some still there was nothing to to alarm him at first entry twig beat logs tripped him fungi on stumps resembled caricatures a moment by their likeness to something familiar and far away fun and exciting it led him on and he penetrated to where the light was the trees crouched nearer and nearer and holes made ugly mouths at ugly mouths at him on either side Everything was very still now, the dust steadily, rapidly gathering in behind and before, and the light seemed to be like flood water. Then the faces began. It was over his shoulder, and he first thought he saw a face, a little evil wedge-shaped face, looking old. When he turned and confronted it, the thing had disappeared. Telling himself cheerfully not to begin imagining things, there was simply no end to it. He passed another hole and another and another, and then, yes, no, yes, certainly, a little narrow face, with hard eyes, and fell from an instant from a hole, and was gone. He hesitated, braced himself, himself up for an effort, and strode on. Then suddenly, if it had been, uh, been so all the time, every hole, far and near, and there were hundreds seemed to possess its face, coming and going rapidly, all fixing on him glass and hatred all hard-eyed and evil and sharp. In the holes in the banks, he thought, there would be no more faces. He swung off and into the, the untrodden places of the wood. Then the whistling began. Very faint and shrill it was, and far behind him, when first he heard it, it made him hurry forward, and then still very faint and shrill far ahead of him, and made him hesitate and want to go back. As he halted in indecision oh, on either side, and seemed to be caught up and passed on throughout wood to its furthest limit. They were up and alert and ready, evident, and he, he was alone and unarmed, and far from any help. And then, then the pattering began. He thought it was only false, so slight and delicate when uh, was the sound of it. Then is it grudge rhythm, and he n knew it for nothing else but the pat, 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 still a very long way off. Was it in front or behind? It seemed to be other than both. It grew and it multiplied, till from every quarter, anxiously, listening this way and that, it seemed to be crossing in on and closing. As he stood still to hearken, the rabbit came run. Uh, a rabbit came through the trees. He waited, expecting it to slacken pace or to swerve from him into a different course. Instead, the animal almost brushed him as it dashed past, set and hard, his eyes staring, Get out of this, you fool! Get out! Muttering as he swung round a stump and disappeared down a friendly burrow. It increased till it sounded like sudden hail on the dry leaf carpet spread. The whole wood 
seemed running now, running hard, hunting, chasing something or somebody. In panic, he began to run too, aim not whither. He ran up against things, he fell over things and into things, he dodged round things. At last, he took refuge in the dark of an old beech tree, which allowed shelter, concealment, perhaps even safety. Who could tell? Anyhow, he was too tired to run any further and could only into the dry leaves, which had drifted into the hole, and hope he was safe. And as they lay there panting and trembling and listening to the whistlings aside, he knew it at last, in all its fullness, that other little dwellers in fields and hedgerows had encountered here, and as their darkest moment that thing which the rat had vainly tried to shield him terror of the wild wood. Meanwhile, the rat, warm and composed by his fireplace, his paper was of half-finished verses slipped from his head, fell backward, his mouth opened, and he wandered by the verdant banks. Then a coal slipped, and the fire crackled, and sent up a smoke with a start. Remembering what he had been engaging upon, floor for his verses, poured over them for a minute, and then looked around for the mole a good rhyme for something or other. But the mole was not, not there, and for a time the house seemed very quiet. Then he said several times, and received no answer, got up and went out into the hall. Ha, a cape was missing from its, un, a, from its accustomed peg. His coat always lay by the umbrella stand, were also gone. The rat fell carefully examined the muddy surface of the ground outside, hoping to find the mole's track. For sure enough, the galoshes were new, just bought for the winter, and the soles were fresh and sharp. He could see the imprints of them in the mud, running purposeful, leading direct to the wild wood. The rat even stood in deep thought for a minute or two. Then he re-entered the house, strapped a belt, shoved a brace of pistols into it, took out a stout cudgel at the corner of the hall, and set off for the wild wood in a smart pace. Towards dusk, when he reached the first fringe of trees, and plunged without wood, looking anxiously on either side for any sign of his friend, here and there little faces popped out of holes, but vanished immediately at the sight of the vicious animal, his pistols and the great ugly cudgel in his grasp and he whistled and which he had heard quite plainly on his first entry died away and all was very still he made his way manfully through the to its furthest edge then forsaking all paths he set himself to traversely working over the whole ground and at the time calling out cheerfully molly molly where are you it's me it's old Ra he had patiently hunted through the woods for an hour or more when at last to his little answering cry guiding himself by the sound he made his way through to the foot of an old beech tree with a hole in it and from out of the hoy saying ratty is that really you the rat crept in and there he found the mole exhausted and still trembling oh rat he cried you can't think Oh, I quite understand," said the rat soothingly. "We really have gone and done it, Mole. I did my best to keep you from it. The river bankers, we by ourselves. If we have to come, we come in couples at least. We all right. Besides, there are a hundred things one has to know and all about, and you don't as yet. I mean, passwords and signs and power and effect and plants you carry in your pocket and verses you repeat and you practice." All simple enough when you know them, but you've got to own if you're small, or you'll find yourself in trouble. Of course, if you're otter, it would be quite another matter. Surely the brave Mr. Toad were by himself, would he? inquired the mole. Oh, Toad? The rat laughing heartily. He wouldn't know his face here. He wouldn't show his face here. A whole the hat full of golden guineas, Toad wouldn't. The mole was by the sound of the rat's careless laughter, as well as by the sight of gleaming pistols, and he stopped shivering and began to feel bolder and more himself again. Then, said the rat presently, we really must pull ourselves together, and home while there's still a little light left. It will never do to spend the night here, you under cold for one thing. Dear ratty, said the poor mole, I'm trapped, but I'm simply dead beat, and... If that's a solid fact, you must let me longer and get my strength back if I'm to get home at all. 
Oh, all right, said the good-natured rat. Rest away. It's pretty nearly pitch dark now, anyhow. There ought to be a bit of moon later. So the mole got well and stretched himself out and presently dropped off into sleep, though of a broken while the rat covered himself up too as best he might for warmth and lay patiently waiting his paw. When at last the mole woke up, such a much a fresh hint, the rat said, Now then, I'll just take a look outside and see if everything's you really must be off. He went to the, the entrance of their retreat out. Then the mole heard him saying quietly to himself, Hello, hello, is a go. What's up, ratty? said the mole. Snow is up, rat briefly. Or rather, down, it's snowing hard. The mole came at him, and looking out, saw the wood that had been so dreadful to him in quite it. Holes, hollows, pools, pitfalls, and other black the wayfarer were vanishing fast, and a gleaming carpet of fairy was spring that, that looked too delicate to be trodden upon by rough feet. A fine powder caressed the cheek with a tingle in its touch, and the black bowls up in a light that seemed to come by from below. Well, well, said the rat, after pondering, we must make a start and take our chance, I suppose. I don't know exactly where we are, and now this snow makes everything look so... It did, indeed. The mole would not have known that it was the same. However, they set out bravely and took the line that seemed to be most holding on to each other and pretending with inevitable cheerfulness that they recognized every fresh tree that grimly and silently greeted them or saw openings gap familiar turn in them in the monetary of white space and that refused to vary. An hour or two later, they had all lost out of time. They pulled out. Uh, pulled up, dispirited, weary, and hopeless, and sat down on a fallen tree trunk to recover their breath and consider what was to be. They were aching with fatigue and bruised with tumbles. They had fallen into several holes through the snow. The snow was getting, uh, ah, and got wet through. The snow was getting so deep that they could hardly drag their and the trees were thicker and more like each other than ever. There seemed to be no end to this wood, and no beginning, and no difference in it. And worst of all, no, we can't sit here very long, said the rat. We shall have to make another push for it, brother. The cold is too awful for anything, and the snow still will soon be too true. He peered about him and considered. Look here, he went on. There's a sort of dell down there in front of us, where the ground seems humpy and hum hummocky. We'll make our way down into that and try and find her, a cave or a hole with the dry floor to it. Wind, and there we'll have a good rest before we try again. Of us pretty dead beat. Besides, the snow may leave off or something may turn up. So once more they got on their feet and struggled down into the dell where they hunted cave or some corner that was dry and a protection from the keen wind snow. They were investigating one of the hummocky bits that Rat had spoken of, who tripped up and fell forward on his face with a squeal. Oh, my leg, he cried, and, and he sat up in the snow and nursed his leg in both his front paws. Oh, said the right yeah, Rat kindly, you don't seem to be having much luck to have a look at your leg. Yes, he went on, going down on his knee to look. You've cut your... Wait till I get on my at my handkerchief, and I'll tie it. I must have tripped, o tripped over a hidden branch or a stump, said the mole miserably. Oh my, it's a very clean cut, said the rat, examining it again alternately. Never done by a branch or a stump. Look as if it was made by something in metal. Funny, he pondered somehow and examined the humps and slopes. That well, never mind what's done it, said the mole, forgetting the grammar. It's hurt just the same, whatever done it. But the rat, after a leg with his handkerchief, had left him and was busy scraping at the snow. He soon explored, all four legs working busily, when the mole waited patient, marked at intervals. Oh, come on, rat! Suddenly the rat cried, Hooray! 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 And fell to executing a feeble jig. What have you found, ratty? asked the mole, still nursing his leg. Come and see the rat as he jigged on. The mole hobbled up to the spot and had a good look. Oh, he said at last, slowly. I see it right enough. Sort of thing before, lots of times. Familiar object, I call it. A door scraper. Well, what of it? Why dance jigs around a door scraper? 
Don't you means you you dull witted animal? cried the rat impatiently. Means replies the mole. It simply means that some vitful person has left his door scraper lying about in the middle of the wild wood. It's sure to trip everybody up. Very thoughtless of him, I call him. I shall go and complain about it to to somebody or I don't. Oh dear, oh dear, cried the rat in despair of his obtuseness. Here, stop our sheep. And he set to work again and made the snow fly in all directions around him. After some further toil, his efforts were rewarded, and a very shabby doormat lay. There, what did I tell you? exclaimed Rat in great triumph. Abs whatever, replied Mole with a perfect with perfect truthfulness. He went on, you seem to have found another piece of domestic litter done for and thrown away, and I'm happy. Better go ahead and dance your jig around what it is uh, if you've got to, and perhaps we can go on and not waste any more time over rubbish heaps. Can you doormat or sleep under a doormat or sit on a doormat and sledge home over the exasperating rodent? D do you mean to say, cried the excited rat, doormat doesn't tell you anything? Really, ratty? said the mole quite. I think you we've had enough of this folly. Who ever heard of a doormat telling anyone? They simply don't do it. They are not that sort at all. Dormies. Now look here, you you thick-headed beast, replied really angry. This must stop. Not another word, but scrape. Scrape and hunt around, especially on the sides of the hummocks. If you want to sleep dry and warm, this is our last chance. The rat attacked a snow bank beside him with art with his cudgel eff, uh, everywhere and then digging with fury, and the two more to apply to the rat than for any other reason, for his opinion was getting light-headed. Some ten minutes hard work, and the point to stuck something, uh, struck something that sounded hollow. He worked till he could feel, then called the mole to come and help. Hard at it went the two ends, the result of their labors, stood full in the view of the astonished and hitherto mole. In the side of what had seemed to be a snowbank stood a little door, painted a dark green, an iron bell pole hung by below it on a small brass plate neatly engraved in square letters by the aid of moonlight. Mr. Badger. The mole fell back from sheer surprise and delight. Rat! He cried in penitence, you're a wonder, that's what you are. I see it all now. You argued it out step by step in that wise head. The very moment that I fell and cut my shin and you looked at that cut and at once you your made yourself door scraper. And then you turned to and found the very door. Did you stop there? No. Some people would have been quite satisfied, but let me on working. Let me only just find a doormat, says to your my theory is proved. And of course you found your doormat. You're so I believe you could find anything you liked. Now, says you, that door exists as plain. There's nothing else remains to be done but to find it. Well, I've read a thing in books, but I never come across it before in my life. There you'll be properly appreciated. You're simply wasted your young among us fellows. Had your heady ready, uh, ratty, but you haven't interrupted rat rat. I suppose you're going to sit in the snow all night and talk? Get hang on to that bell pull you see there and ring hard as hard as you can while I while the rat attacked the door with its stick and mole sprang up with the bell and swung there, both his feet went off the ground, and from quite a little faintly hear a deep toned bell respond. We have time for one more chapter. It's chapter four, Mr. Badger. They waited patiently for what seemed a very long time, stamping in the snow to keep feet warm. At last they heard the snow of slow, uh, of, uh, the sound of shuffling footsteps approaching the door from the inside. It seemed as the mole remarked, like someone walking in carpet slippers, that they were too for him and down at, uh, and down at heel which was into a mole, because that was exactly what it was. There was the nut back, and the door opened a few inches and up to show a very long and a large and sleepy blinking eye, a pair of sleepy blinking eyes. The very next time this happens, said a gruff and suspicious voice, exceedingly angry, who is it this time disturbing people in such a night? Speak up, badger, cried the rat. 
Let us in, please. It's me, Rat, and my friend Mole lost our way in the snow. What, Ratty, my dear little man, exclaimed quite a different voice. Come along in, both of you, at once. Why, you must animals stumbled over each other in their eagerness to get in. The badger, who wore a long dressing gown and whose slippers were indeed very, carried a flat candlestick in his paw and had probably bed when their summons sounded. He looked kindly down on them and patted both their heads. Not the sort of night for small animals to be out, he said paternally. I'm up to some, some of your pranks again, Ratty. But how long coming to the first-rate fire there and supper and everything? He shuffled on in front of the light, and they followed him, nudging each other in their anticipation and hating sort of way, down a long, gloomy, and to tell the truth, decidedly shabby path into a sort of central hall, out of which they could dimly see tunnel-like passages, branching, which is mysterious and without apparent end. But there were doors in the hall as well, still looking doors. One of those was Badger. No, one of these, the Badger flung around themselves in all the glow and warmth of a large kitchen fire. The floor was well worn red bricks, and on the wide fire of the logs, between two attractive chimney corners tucked away in the wall, of an, any suspicious of draught. A couple of high backed settles facing each other in either side of the fire gave further sitting for the sociable, sociably disposed. In the middle of the room stood a long table boards placed on trestles, with benches down each side. At one end, chairs stood pushed back, where spread the remains of Badger's plain but amp supper. Rows of spotless plates winked from the shelves of the dresser end of the room, and from the rafters overhead hung hams, bundles of dried herb, onions, and baskets of eggs. It seemed a place where heroes would fit leadery, where weary harvesters would line up in scores along the table, harvest home with mirth and song, or where two or three friends of simple to sit about as they pleased, and eat and smoke and talk in comfort and contentment. The brick floor smiled up at the smoky ceiling, the oaken settles, shiny wood, exchanged cheerful glances with each other, plates on the dresser, grin elf, and the merry firelight flickered and played over everything without distinction. The kindly badger thrust them down on a settle to tow fire and bade them remove their wet coats and boots. Then they dressing gown, then he fetched them dressing gowns and slippers, and himself bathed the mole in water and mended the cut with sticking plaster, until the whole thing was just as good as better. In the embracing light and warmth, warm and dry and Last weary legs propped up in front of them, and a suggestive pink of plates being behind. It seemed to the storm driven animals now in path safe anchor. The cold and trackless wild wood was left outside, uh, it was miles and miles away, and all that they had suffered in it in a half. When at last they were thoroughly toasted, the badger summoned them to the tip and busy laying a repast. They had felt pretty hungry but then they actually saw at last the supper that was spread for them really it was only a question of what they would attack first where all was, and whether the other things were obligingly uh, would obligingly wait for them till they give them attention conversation was impossible for a long time and resumed it was that regrettable sort of conversation that results from talking with your mouth badger did not mind that sort of thing at all nor did he take any notice of elbows on the table, but he speaking at once. As he did not go into society himself, he had got these things belonged to the things that didn't really matter. We know, of course, that he and took uh, too narrow a we know of them took too narrow a view, because they do matter very much, though it would take too long to explain. He sat in his armchair at the head of the table and nodded gravely at interval told their story and he did not seem surprised or shocked or anything, and he never told you so or just what I always said, or remarked that they ought to have done so-and-so, or ought not to have done something else, and to feel very friendly toward him. When summer was really finished at last, and each that his skin was now as tight as was decently safe, and that he didn't care a hang for anybody or anything, they gathered round the great wood fire, 
and thought how jolly it was to be sitting up so late, pennant and so full, and after they had chatted for a time about things in general, the badger, now then, tell us the news about your parts of the world. How's old? Oh, from bad to worse, said the rat, while the mole, cocked up on a settle and basking in the firelight, his heels tried to look properly mournful. Another smash-up only last week, and a bestie he will insist on driving himself, and he's hopelessly incapable. If he don't steady, well-trained animal, pay him good wages and leave everything to him, all right, but no, he's convinced he's a heaven-born driver, and nobody can teach him any follows. How many has he had? inquires the inquiry. Smashes or machines? asks the rat. Oh, well, after all, it's the same thing. Uh, this is his seventh. As for the others, you know that coach house of his? Well, it's really piled up to the roof with fragments of motor cars, none of them bigger than you. That accounts for the other six, so far as they can be accounted for. He's been in hospital three times, put in the mole, and as for the times he's had to pay, it's simply awful to think of. Yes, and that's part of the trouble, continues the rat, which we all know, but he's not a millionaire, and he's hopelessly bad driver of law and order. Killed or ruined, it's got to be one of the two things. Badger, we're his friends. Oughtn't we to do something? The badger went thinking. Now look here, he said at last, rather severely. Of course you know nothing now. His two friends assented, quite understanding his point. No, according to the rules of animal etiquette, is ever expected to do anything strenuous or moderately active during the off-season of winter. All are sleepy. Some actually... All are weather-bound, more or less, and all are resting from arduous day, which every muscle in them has to be severely tested, and every energy kept. Very well, then, continued the badger, but when once the year turned and the nights are shorter and the half and halfway through them, one rouses and feels to be up and doing by sunrise, if not before, you know, animals nodded gravely, they knew. Well, then, badger, we, that is, you and me and your friend the mole here, we'll take to hand. We'll stand no offense whatsoever. We'll bring him back force if need be. We'll make him be a sensible toad. We'll bat, not me, said the rat, waking up with a jerk. He's been asleep two or three times, said the mole, laughing. He himself was feeling quite wakeful, and even like he didn't know why. The reason was, of course, that he being naturally and under and breeding, the situation of Badger's home exactly suited him and made him feel at rat, who slept every night in the bedroom, the windows of which opened on a breezy river, the atmosphere still and oppressive. Well, it's time we were all in bed and up and fetching flat candlesticks. Come along, you two. I'll show you to your court. Time tomorrow morning. Breakfast at any hour you please. He conducted the two in a room that seemed half bedchamber and half loft. The badger winter seed were visible everywhere, took up half the room, piles of apples, baskets full of nuts, and jars of honey, but the two little white beds on the floor, soft and inviting, and the linen on them, though coarse, beautifully of lavender, and the mole and the white rat shaking off their garments in some thirty in beneath, in between the sheets in great joy and contentment. In between the badgers and junctions, the two tired animals came down to breakfast, very morning, and found a, a, brief, a bright fire burning in the kitchen, and two sitting on a bench at the table, eating oatmeal porridge out of wooden bowls. The head spoons rose to their feet and ducked their heads respectfully as the two entered. Sit down, said the rat pleasantly, and go on with your porridge. Where have you two youngsters away in the snow, I suppose? Yes, please, sir, said the elder of the two hedgehogs respectfully. Me and little Billy here, we were trying to find our way to school. Mother would have us, was the weather ever so, and, of course, we lost ourselves, sir, and Billy, he got frightened, being young and faint-hearted, and at last we happened up little against Mr. and made so bold as to knock, sir, for Mr. Badger. He's a kind-hearted gentleman, as everyone knows, said the rat, cutting himself with some rashers from the side of the bacon, dropped some eggs into a saucepan. And what's the weather like outside? You needn't so much, he added. Oh, terrible bad, sir, terrible deep the snow is, said the head, getting out of the likes of the gentleman today. Where's Mr. Badger? inquired the mole as he popped before the fire. Master's gone into his study, sir, said the hedgehog, is how he was going to be 
particularly busy this morning and on no account. This explanation, of course, was thoroughly understood by everyone. The fact is, as already set forth, when you live a life of intense activities in the year, and of no comparative or actual solemnness for the other six, during the latter period, you cannot be continuing sleepiness when there are people about or things to be done. The excuse gets though the animals will, uh, well knew that Badger, having eaten a hearty breakfast, to his study and settled in an armchair with his legs up on another and a red over his face and was being busy in the usual way as the front doorbell clanged loudly and the rat who was very greasy with buttered to billy the smaller hedgehog to see who it might be there was a sound of much stamping in the hall. billy returned in front of the otter who threw himself on the rat with an, a shout of affectionate greeting get off spluttered the rat with his mouth full Thought I should find you here all right, said the author. They were all in a great state of alarm along River Bank when I arrived this morning. Matt never been home all night, nor Mole neither. Something dreadful must have happened. I covered up all your tracks, of course, but I knew that when people were in six, they mostly went to Badger, or else Badger got to know of it somehow. So I came here through the wild wood and the snow. My, it was fine coming through the snow as the rain and showing against the black tree trunks. As you went along in the stillness, every masses of snow slid off the branches suddenly with a plop, making you jump for cover. Snow castles and snow caverns had sprung out of up out, and snow bridges, terraces, ramparts. I could have stayed and played with here and there great branches and been torn away by the sheer weight of the snow. Ashton hopped on them in their perky, conceited way, just as if they had done it. A ragged string of wild geese passed overhead, high on the gray sky, and a few rooks were inspected and flapped off homewards with a disgusted expression. But I meant to ask the news of. About halfway across, I came on a rabbit sitting on a silly face with his paws. He was a pretty scared animal when I crept up behind him and placed him on his shoulder. I had to cuff on his head once or twice to get any sense out of the dog. At last I managed to extract from him that Mole had been seen in the wild wood just two of them. It was the talk of the burrows, he said, how Mole and Mr. Rat's particular bad fix, how he had lost his way and they were up uh, and, and were chivying him round and round. Then they didn't any of, any of you do something, I asked. You mayn't be blessed with brains, but hundreds of you big stout fellows, as fat as butter and your burrows running in all direct, you could have taken him in the maid, him in and made him safe and comfortable or tried tense. What, us? He merely said, do something. Us rabbits? So I cuffed him. There was nothing else to be done. At any rate, I had something I had learned. And if I had the luck to, uh, to meet any of them, I'd have learned or they would. Weren't you at all, uh, nervous? Asked some of yesterday's terror coming back to him at the mention of the wild wood. The otter showed a gleaming set of strong white teeth as he laughed. Give them nerves if any of them tried anything on me. Here, Mole, Fram, like a good ch little chap you are. I'm frightfully hungry, and I'm say to Ratty here, haven't seen him for an age. So, having cut some slices of ham, set the hedgehogs to fry it, and returned breakfast, while the otter and the rat, their heads together, eagerly talked river shop, long shop, and talk that is endless, running on like the babbling river itself. A plate of fried ham had just been cleared and sent back for more, and the yawning and rubbing his eyes, and greeted them all in his quiet, simple way. Inquiries of everyone. It must be getting... Uh, on him, he remarked to Otter. Better stop and have it with us. You must be hungry this cold morning. Rather, replied Otter, winking at the mole. The sight of these greedy young hedge themselves with fried ham makes me feel positively famished. The heads, who were just beginning to feel hungry again after their porking so hard as at their frying, looked timidly up at Miss, but were too shy to say anything. Here, you two youngsters, be off home to your mother. I'll send someone with you to show you the way. You won't want any dinner today, I'll be bound. He gave them sixpence apiece and a pat on the head, and they went off with much swinging of caps and touching of forelocks. Presently, I, they all sat together. 
The mole found himself placed next to Mr. Badger, and as they were still deep in river gossip from which nothing could divert them, he took the owl badger how comfortable and how homelike it all felt to him. Wonderground, he said, you know exactly where you are. Nothing can happen to you and not you. You're entirely your own master. You don't have to consult anybody they say. Things go on, and you run all the same overhead, and you let them, and you don't bother about them. When you want go, and there are things, and there the things are waiting for you. And on him, that's exactly what I say, he replied. There's no security or peace or except underground. And then, if your ideas get large to expand, why, a dig and a scrape, and there you are. If you feel too big, you stop up a hole or two, and there you are again. No builders, no tradesmen passing on you by fellows looking over your wall, and above all, no. Look at Rat now. A couple of feet of flood water, and he's got to move into high, uncomfortable, and inconveniently suited, and horribly expensive. Take Toad. I say nothing against Toad Hall, first house in these parts, as a house. But suppose if a fire breaks out, where sting tiles are blown off, or walls sink or cracked, or windows get broken. Supposing the house's rooms are drafty. I hate a draft myself. Where's to up and out of the doors is good enough to roam about and get one living, one's living in. But underground to come back to at last, that's my idea of home. The mole assented heartily, and the badger in consequence got very friendly with him. Lunch is over, he said. I'll take you all round this little place of mine. I can see it. You understand what domestic architecture ought to be. You do. After lunch, and when the other two had settled themselves into the chimney corner and had started on the subject of eels, the badger lighted a lantern. I'll follow him, crossing the heels, uh, crossing the hall, down one of the principal tunnels, and the wavering light of the lantern glimpsed on either side of rooms, both large and small, some mere cupboards, as broad and imposing as Toad's dining hall. A narrow passage at right and into another corridor. And here, the same thing was repeated. Mole was staggered by the size, the extent, the ramifications of it all, and the dim passageways, the solid vaultings of the crammed store chamber, scenery everywhere, the pillars, the arches, the pavements. How on earth, Bass, did you ever find time and strength to do all this? It's astonishing. Astonishing indeed, said the badger simply. If I had done it, but as a matter of fact, I did none of it. Only cleaned out the passages and chambers as far as I had need. There's lots more of it, all uh, running about. I see you don't understand night to you. Very well. Very long ago, on the spot where the wild wood went, before ever it had planted itself and grown up up to where uh, grown up, there was a city, a city of people, you know, here where we. Are lived and walked and talked and slept and carried on their business. He their horses and feasted from here. They rode out to fight the trade. They were a powerful people and rich and great builders. They, were, they thought their city would last forever. But what has become of them all? Who can tell, said Badger. People come, they stay for a while, they flourish, they build. Uh, that is their way, but we remain. There were badgers here before that city, uh, same city, ever came to be. And now, there are badgers. We are an enduring lot, and we may move out for a time. Wait, and we're patient, and back we come. And so it will. Well, and last, those people, said the mole. When they went, continued Badger, the persistent rain took the matter in hand patiently, ceaselessly, year after year. There's two in our small way. Helped a little. Who knows? It was all down gradually. Ruin and leveling and disappearance. Then it was all up, up, up. Grew to saplings and saplings to forest trees. And bramble and fern came creeping. Leaf mold rose and obliterated. Streams in their winter brought sand and soil to clog and to cover, and in course of time, for us again, and we moved in. Up above us, on the surface, the same thing happened. Like the look of the place, took up their quarters, settled down, spread and flourished. Didn't bother themselves about the past. They never do. They're always busy. 
the place being hillocky, naturally, and a, full of holes, but that was rather... And they don't bother about the future, either. The future when perhaps in again, for a time, as may very well be. The wild wind populated by now, with all the usual lot, good, bad, and indifferent, I names. It takes all sorts to make a world, but I fancy you know something about this time. I do indeed, said the mole with a slight shiver, said the badger, patting him on the shoulder. It was your first experience of they're not so bad, really, and we must all live and let live. Pass the word round tomorrow, and I think you'll have no further trouble. Any friend of mine, where he likes in this country, or I'll know the reason why. To the kitchen again, they found the rat white walking up and down very restlessly. The atmosphere was oppressing him and getting on his nerves, and he seemed really to be the river would run away if he wasn't there to look after it. So he had his overcoat thrust into his belt again. Come along, Mole, he said anxiously as soon as he caught sight of him. Get off while it's daylight. Don't want to spend another night in the wild wood again. It'll be all right, my fine fellow, said the otter. I'm coming along with you, and I know every old. If that, that there's a head that needs to be punched, you can confidently upon me to punch it. You really need not fret, Ratty, said the badger placidly. It has run further than you think, and I've bolt holes to the edge of the directions, though I don't care for anybody to know about them. When you really have to buy one of these shortcuts, meantime, make yourself easy and sit the rat was nevertheless still anxious to be off and set uh, attention to the badger, taking up his lantern again, led the way along the damp and airless that wound and dipped and part vaulted, part hewn from for a weary distance that seemed to be miles. At last, daytime began to use it through tangled growth, overhanging the mouth of the passage, and then a hasty goodbye. Pu uh, pushed them hurriedly through the opening and looked as natural as possible again, with creeps, brushwood, and dead leaves. They found themselves standing on the very edge of the wild wood, rocks and roots behind them, confusedly heaped and heaped and tangled. In front, a great space of quiet folks hemmed by lines of hedges, black on the far and far ahead, a glint of the familiar old river, while the wintry sun hung on the horizon. The otter, as knowing all the paths, took charge and they trailed out on the bee line for a distant style. Being there a moment, and looking back, they saw the whole mass of rounding of roundings simultaneous nope, I they saw the whole mass of the wild wood, dense, menacing, compact, grimly set white surroundings. Simultaneously they turned and made swift for home and the familiar things it played on for the voice sounding cheerily out of the river that they knew and trusted in all its moods that never made them afraid any amazement as they hurried along eagerly anticipating to be at home again among the things they knew and liked the mole sat clear saw clearly that he was an animal of tilled field and linked to the plow furrow and frequent uh, frequented past the lane of evening lingerlings and the cultivated garden plot, asperities, the stubborn endurance, or the clash of act that went with nature in the rough. It must be wise, must keep the places in which his lines were laid, and which held adventure enough to last for a lifetime. But since we only have seven minutes left, and that's the end of the chapter, I'll stop for now. Being in to listen, and I hope to see you again next time. And I encourage you to shop local. Thank you.